tonight. Um, Golden Mares is part of the Silent War of the Samurai. It's a piece that I didn't expect to write and shows a part of the time traveling war that I didn't expect to see. I'm going to read this, do my introduction, and then we're going to decode it and see what it has to share for us. Gilded Mares, 16 years after the escape. Kai pulled his hood up against the rain as he stepped over the drunk Trimerian in the gutter. He stopped to turn back, looking at her again. Could he let this woman die? Was this person vital? He missed so many lately. Had been given chances to tep, step in at the right time, yet it all slipped away. Doubt and grief riddled his mind as he stared at the woman bleeding in the street. He gripped the handle of his sword and felt the sour eye moving through him, the familiar fever rushing across his skin, the trembling, the shaking, the ache in his chest. He felt his heart beating frantic and off rhythm and wondered how much longer his heart would hold out. He saw nothing. This woman could die and the world would not miss her. She had no family, had no dealings with the most important people in the world. He could let this one go. He turned and walked away and thought of the ring on his finger. 20 more healing powers waited in that ring for the most important, the most vital. He stopped thinking about the woman dying in the street and everything from his training so long ago. <clears throat> everything in the knighthood taught him to run, taught him ran through his mind. He wanted so bad to use the ring, but Kai kept walking. He had to choose who lived and died. And this was the, the death he had to go, let go. As he walked up the stairs to the door of the pub, a tiny part of him, of his resolve died. He let too many go. When would these, when would times like these break the good that remained in his soul? When would every pure thing within him turn to callous cold? He swung the doors open and the sights and smells of the pub hit him in the face. Vomit, sour ale, poorly spiced food, sweat and blood. The gilded marriage was a whole. He had seen its slow descent over the 400 years he'd been coming here, had watched it become this. What had been a well-lit place of warmth and revelry was now this rotting shell. Maybe Places like this slowly festered because of the meetings like the ones here tonight. <sighs> Maybe it was the eye. He stepped over a few puddles of questionable liquid past the privy and the reek that emanated through the door and into the main room. He turned left to a hall where the booth waited. He braced himself and pulled back the curtain. Within glaring at, up at him sat Harask in a brown wool robe with a ratted mane. The scar and the hairline Kai had given him 300 years ago still knotted his dun-colored hair. Kai locked eyes with the immortal enemy, seeing one smoky with age and one glowing and sickly green. And he felt his stomach, he felt sick to his stomach from the pure evil radiating off the beast. Harass motions the bench across him and Kai dropped into a seat. 
Still can't get used to your skin, Kai said. It stopped glowing 3,000 years ago. Yet every time I've seen you since, it's been startling. I guess there is old, too old for a Trimerian. Her ass chilled his blood. Kai, no more than five foot six, stared across at his nemesis, who even seated, towered over him at seven feet tall and 300 pounds. The wound Harash received two weeks ago had yet to heal. It still rattled from his forehead to his jawline to, on the left. It had not been seen to. The wound would scar ragged and horrifying, but after thousands of years of battle and war they'd seen, the two of them had begun to stop healing. The body would only fix itself so many times, and over 300,000 years of jumping time, had left their bodies exhausted and worn. I ordered for you, Harass said. Your meal will be here soon. I thought I owed you that much. Did you bring the wine? Kai pulled the flask from his threadbare bear bag and set the ornate wine bottle on the table between them. Kai pulled a thin mug. He filled it. Then Harass gripped the bottle and took a long swig. He squished a mile the wine on his mouth for a while and lifted the thick graying eyeball. The nighting of ivory, of rave ivory fist. Tresk scowled and tipped the bottle again. I thought I stopped ivory fist from becoming a knight. Thought I forced a self, self exile, Marash said. That dagger was supposed to lock him up for 50,000 years. Harash switched the, switched the wine in his mouth again. Trimerian wine was named after the greatest event to occur that year. If the connoisseur was talented enough and perfected their palate, they could name that event. How did you do it? How did you free Femilis from the blade? Harash asked. Kai longed to speak and gloat of his victory with the sarcastic tongue, but the curse held him fast. Kai had not heard his own voice. 530,000. 587 years. He pulled his enchanted scroll and laid it in front of Harask. He laid his palm on it and his thoughts scribbled themselves across the page. He turned the scroll to Tarask, called in collective. I nudged Rolf Calden towards specializing in magical weapons, whispered in his ear of the Thorn Brothers, Kai wrote. I hid the short sword and the bastard sword. There's no way you found them. Harask said. <sighs> Kai felt exhausted just thinking of the centuries he'd spent searching for the weapon. He'd been forced to sneak the blades into the crystal citadel so none of the old companions could see him. The chore had been nearly impossible, but he won Glimmer's office and got back out. Harass took another long swig of the bottle, and Kai took a sip from his tin cup. The rich flavor of the grape and the slight hint of smoke of the wine tasted like victory. You still have no answer for many keep, Harask said. The stains still roam untouched. The city of Hemlock is overrun with vampires. And when Terra Trape is awoken, this world will breed, will bleed. Another tip of the bottle, more swishing of the wine. Kai hoped the vintage tasted like defeat. The waitress dropped the filthy plate in front of Kai and scowled at him. Back again, she said. Her tongue was too big for her mouth and she spat when she spoke. Every year you bastards show up. Every year bad luck follows. When are you going to leave us? When will your dark visits end? Kai wanted to answer but knew she couldn't read. He had no way of warning her of the fate of the pub, no way of warning her what would befall this place in just 10 short years. He looked at his pasta with disgust. He wanted to hide his contempt for the meal, but was losing the ability to fake emotions. He could not look up from his plate and could not keep his head, and could only keep his head down. My friend has so much to say, Harash said, but he's too kind to speak his mind. So I will tell you the, myself, the quality of your meals keeps rising. Soon the finest of foods will be served here. Just look at the swill you're slopping around now. Kai looked at the wilted vegetables and globs of gray meat mixed in with the odd shaped noodles he knew would be tough. Then he looked up and tried to smile. The woman pulled back on the grimace. <clears throat> Even his smile was a nightmare now. 
the waitress dropped a poorly cooked, overspiced turkey in front of Harask, and he grinned at her. His teeth were black, lips torn. The waitress left. She did not look back as Kai watched her go. He saw her limp had gotten worse. He thought of the time he had come here years, years ago and the stab wound she had taken in the leg. He thought of the ring in his pocket that could have healed her and the cold sensation hit him. He pushed the plate away and grasped grinned. Yeah, that's right. Shove it away. Let yourself get weak. You won't need your strength, he said with a chuckle. <sighs> Kai sighed and pulled the, meat, the meal back before him. He looked for utensils, but the waitress had not brought any. He took off his gloves and ate with his fingers. Septimu was a nice touch, Arask said. Ember had no answer for him. You even tricked me into sending so Simon straight to her. He shoved his fingers into the breast of the turkey and with a grip and a rip pulled the meat free. It was still a bit pink, but Sarask would not die from uncooked food. There was no way Kai's luck was that strong. Kel and Justine do not bother me as much as you think they do, Kai wrote. There are other paths to a vast day for Peter than just their child. Well, I invite you to find them, but only a half-blood will work. You know that, Horask said. A half-blood can be arranged. And love, let's not forget, the child must be conceived in love, Horask said. I have you in this. The red fist will flail unguided. There's no father who could raise a child better than Kel. I invite you to find one. Kai made an obscene gesture, knowing he had yet to find the right man. Her ass gripped the leg and ripped it free from the bird. He bit into the joint, snapping the bone and chewed. Juice and the faintest amount of blood spurted and ran down his chin. He wiped it with his mint-like hand and kept chewing. They ate in silence for a while before her ass laughed. He pulled something from his hip and dropped it on the table between them. Wanted to give you this. The item was a blackened skull, partially shattered with jagged edges and still wet. I'm going to give you this just to watch you squirm, Horask said. Kai looked at the object with dread. Whose skull was he looking at? What type of hellish path would this lead him on? Kai touched his hand to the scroll. Who does it belong to? Trolava Bintek, Harask said. Kai did not know that name, did not know if this was a chase he should even make. This might very well be a bluff to waste his time, could very well be smoke and mist. You don't know him, Harask laughed, a deep bellowing sound that fills Kai's head with hopelessness and caused it to instantly ache. Kai, la Kai winced, the last headache he'd suffered lasted a year and a half. The slow healing of his body would keep this one raging even longer. When this is over, I think I'll let you live, Horask said. I'll probably have to by that time. I don't think the eye will let us die anymore. It only wishes for us to suffer. When this is over, and you've either saved the world or I have destroyed it, we'll find a place on the mountain somewhere to live forever in misery. I think by that time, we will be too far into our insanity to, <laughs> to ever come back. Kai looked at Harask and saw it then. The tremble of the hands, the oily hair, the teeth in Harask's mouth were smaller from grinding them together. You're having the nightmares too, Kai wrote. Harask dropped the knotted bone at the length of the lead, leg to rattle on a table and looked at the turkey. Kai saw the man had just lost his appetite. Do you dream of her? <clears throat> Harask said, mine is a dog, not a woman, but yeah, I keep dreaming of a hunter, Kai said. Every time I see it, I lose my mind a bit. She started out beautiful. Mine did too, Kai wrote. But every time I see her, she gets angrier. Her ass head dropped on his shoulders. He gripped the second breast. He needed to keep up his strength too. More silence descended on them. Kai ate the lumpy pasta and her ass chewed his turkey bones all and all. When finished, Kai licked his fingers clean and her ass wiped his hands on his ratty woolen robe. 
Kai dropped the gold piece on the table and set his tin plate on it. Horesk stood and they looked at each other. I stopped hating you 70,000 years ago, Horesk said. Now I wish you would just stop. Kai grabbed this scroll off the table and touched him. He held it up to Horesk and felt all the exhaustion fall on him again. If you quit, I will. Deep in his heart, Kai hoped Horask would snarl and stomp off. He thought of the sensation of time travel as it ripped him into his next tiny battle. He remembered how thrilling it had been at first. How could, could feel, feel it in his bones now, chewing and gnashing, the need gripping him to jump again. He knew addiction when he saw it. He just never thought he would feel it. Horask looked at the scroll for a long time. Kai knew he was feeling it too. They were trapped by need now. Neither could quit. Horask looked around and smiled. No, Horask said. It all burns. And one day we'll sit on a cliff somewhere looking out at the ash and wait for our death. The two enemies walked out of the Gilded Mare and Kai saw children rifling through the pockets of the dead Trimerian. One fought to pull her boot off and Horask grinned as they stepped into the ring. Just let her die, huh? He said. How many more of those can you handle? Kai pulled his hood up and turned to go. Harak, Harask walked west up the street and Kai walked east. He got in 10 steps. Hey, Kai, Harask said. Kai turned to look back. Harask reached out faster than fast and snatched the man walking by. Kai's heart stopped as Harask spun the man, dripping him in a headlock and smiled. Kai pulled his crystal sword, seeing the sickly green glow it had begun to take on about 20,000 years ago. Horask pulled his demon steel fist dagger. He stabbed the man in the face six, seven times before the kids ran. The streets cleared as the man in Horask's arms screamed in horror. The body bent, his head, his hair turning white as his limbs snapped in the light, the curling legs of a dying, dying spider. Harass stabbed the man four times, four more times before dropping him to the ground. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Kai stared in horror, praying that man was not important. Harask was enveloped in green light. Kai saw a bit of ecstasy on his face before he vanished. Kai rushed to the dead man's side and looked down at him. He drove the blade of his crystal sword into the man's dead body and sobbed at what he saw. Kai stumbled back and dropped to his knees. He looked at his sword, knowing it would never end. He felt a throb in his cloak and then another one. He felt a bud bulge there and gripped the cloak back to see the throbbing brownish object on his chest under his shirt. He ripped the shirt back and saw the heart fused to his chest, covered over with scars and pounding. Kai had a second heart. How he had gotten it or why, he did not know, but he had to set it all aside. He needed to find Julius Chris. The vile assassin would be moving through this town 21 years ago. Kai had to hire him to kill Reichard the Braun. There were still vampires in Hemlock. This might fix that. Kai stumbled down the street, feeling a stabbing pain on his leg. He was walking with a limp now. He looked down at the dead men in the street inside. He needed to find out who Trolava Bintak was. Okay, so that was Gilded Mares. Um, we're gonna do the stuff that we normally do. Uh, first of all, here's my pocket square for the week. Um, <clears throat> it's brown. Uh, my shirt looks brown, but it's not, it's brown. This is my brown leather hat. <laughs> um, there's, there's a funny story with it. Um, we went to a hat store it's uh everything men's store um it's called just for him anyway we went there and <clears throat> my son was there and i was trying on hats and um the moment i put this one on like i looked at me and she's like i hope that's not expensive because that's coming with us um so anyway so i had this hat uh and uh so in the last video, um, 
you saw about 25 seconds of a uh, collection of shells. It started at Benny's base and went straight up a collection of shells to, um, well, it's a collection of D&D books, Dungeons and Dragons books. Um, it's been in my life forever. It always will be. Uh, this is the books that um, started all this and is uh, <clears throat> it's going to see me to, through to the end. Um, I like to run games and then um, then uh, use those games as inspiration, um, basically to create characters, um, characters that I then use for other things. I've got hundreds of NPCs that I bring back to the games over and over again, and it all plays out and it leads to other things. I got um, a gaming group now, they live in Milwaukee and I don't Skype games. So every now and then they'll come down, um, play for a while, uh, and then go home. Usually we pull eight hour days, um, and they'll be down for like nine days. So, um, we just play, break for dinner and go into midnight. So, um, anyway. That's that's what you saw last night, um, last last week. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, today is the last Sunday of the month of September, and we went to a um, poetry slam. Becca does poetry slams at the end of every month. Uh, always on the last Sunday of December. Um, she does a, a poetry slam. It's amazing. Um, she gets to do between three to two poems. And she has, she always has them memorized. Um, most everybody else reads off a phone or a piece of paper or something like that, but she has hers memorized. Um, she's getting better and better. As we go on, this was the third one that we had, um, that we went to. And the more I see her on stage, um, the more comfortable she gets and the more, um, she's just found herself in poetry. Uh, so check it out. I know I plugged it before, but I'm gonna plug it again. Song of the Leviathan. Um, the thing about Song of the Leviathan um, is if you've read Teardrop Road, you know that the Leviathan is um, a character in Teardrop. And for some reason that I can't explain, that I'll never be able to explain. Um, the Leviathan is my wife. It's like uh, I used to I used to go to this bridge in Devil's Elbow, which is a town, tiny little town, um, not far from Fort Leonard Wood. There's a bridge out there. And I may have read about it on one of these episodes in one of these seasons, but I'm going to talk about it again. Um, a lot of different stories came to me, and I told them to a lot of different people, taking them out to the bridge and showing them um, <clears throat> where my magic lives. Uh, and there was a story that I never told. Um, about a woman of the river 
that called herself the Leviathan. Every time that I went there, I could I could hear her tail swishing in the water. Every now and then we'd hear the slap of her tail in the water. Everybody'd be like, what is that? What is that? And I had a friend who was well versed in um fishing and hunting and all that kind of stuff. She was a real outdoors woman. And she'd always say that it was a fish jumping, but I knew better. So I took Becca, when we started dating, I took her to the bridge and I told her the story of the Leviathan and brought her to the edge of the, of the bridge so that she could listen to the swishing of the tail and it wasn't there and it never has been again. The best way that I can describe it is very hazy, um, very confusing. Um, I was dreaming of a soulmate when I told those stories. The Viathan actually lived in that river until she became a living woman, which was when Becca's happiness and power woke up, which also happened to be when the two of us got together. <laughs> it's it's really hard to explain. So like, okay, why did my friends hear fish jumping? Why did I always hear this, the tail swishing? Um, none of it makes any sense. But uh, Somehow it's true because it's gone there. Um, so Song of the Little Leviathan is uh, the song of Becca and her, I guess you would call it her spirit animal or <clears throat> something like that, her true identity. Um, it's a book you should read. It's uh, autobiographical. Um, some really amazing poetry in it and uh you should give it a chance <sighs> she's got a lot of books laying around the house and she just wants to give them out <laughs> free uh, she wants to just give them give them to people she says she wants to break capitalism um by giving her book out for free uh so she gave five away today at the Poetry Slam and she'll bring more next month. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's got probably 95 books sitting in um, our living room. I could probably get a hold of one for you if you'd be willing to pay postage and send this postage on PayPal. I could probably get a hold of you, one for you and get it out to you. I haven't asked Becca about that, but I'm sure she'd be fine with it. She's trying to break, break capitalism by giving you something of value for free. Uh, so anyway, like I said, we've talked about it before. Um, in the last, uh, the last episode of last season, you got to see her, you got to hear some of her poetry. Um, so if you want to check it out before you ask for it, just, um, go to that, that episode and, um, go to that episode and, uh, And check it out. She reads, I think, five poems, six poems, six poems. And uh, you can see uh, her style and stuff like that. Okay. So I've talked about that now. Um,
So, okay, so I'm going to pull up um, Gilded Mares, which was the story I just read to you. Uh, I'm going to pay, I'm going to pull up Gilded Mares. And we're going to go through this a little bit at a time. Gilded Mares took me by surprise because Gilded Mares <clears throat> is part of, well, of course, it's part of uh, the silent war of the Sauri. There's a war going on between two traveling wizards, um, one named Kai, one named Harask. I get into some of it um, in season one, where I decode some of the stories. We're going to do that again today. Gilded Mares is a uh, <clears throat> Gilded Mares is a bar uh, that is slowly decaying. People are starting to, the people that work there, the people that frequent the place are starting to fall apart. Um, they're falling apart because these two nemesis meet there to uh, to eat once every who knows see they're the only people that understand each other um, nobody knows what it's like to live this long to study the world this long to do these things that they're doing nobody knows what it's like except them so they are the only ones they can talk to so it's possible that Kai left this bar and talked to the person he wanted to talk to he would have had to send them back in time and then um, <coughs> and then um, Kai immediately came back. At the same time, Harask could have uh, been gone for one year, uh, 9,000 years before he came back on the same night. They just, uh, they're both lonely and uh, they're the only one that understands. So we got Kai, he comes in, <coughs> sees a Tremerian woman dying in an alley and he has to decide whether she's important enough to save. He has a ring of healing. I don't know if he can get another one, um, but he's got a ring of healing and he uses it to heal important people that would otherwise die. And he's got to decide if she's important enough to heal or not. He uses that by, he, he figures it out by using his sword. Um, and what he finds out is that she's, she doesn't do anything to save or destroy the world. So he just lets her die. And for a person as good as Kai, that has to be, well, at the end of this, her ask says, how many more of these can you see before you lose it? Um, okay, so the Gilded Mares, they come often, um, never on the same day, always within the same time frame as they travel back and forth. Um, Harask, you might remember um, from the story of the slave that Harask has a green eye. That green eye is basically his eye that was uh, 
that became rancid. Um, her ask was actually in a book that I wrote <clears throat> called Purgatory. We see a god of time. And one of the names he goes by is Harask. So Harask is actually a god, of, the god of time, who is trapped by Dotley the Elder in Dotley's tower. We saw that in um, the slave. They freed him. He's so weak now, he can't do what they could normally do, but he can travel in time and he can push things um and make things happen that cause big problems um now uh trimerians when they get really old they their um their skin begins to glow um when he sits down to talk to harask harass says i still can't get used to your skin it stopped glowing 4,000 years ago. Every time I've seen it since, it's been startling. I guess there's old, <clears throat> there's an old, too old for a Trimerian. Um, <clears throat> the oldest Trimerians known are, like, the oldest, uh, there are some Trimerians that date back to the beginning of the race, and they're all 120,000 ish years old. Uh, Kai is so much older than that because he's been jumping through time doing doing things. Um, and uh, it's gotten to the point where his his skin doesn't doesn't glow anymore. He doesn't heal like he used to. Um, it says in here that he had a headache for a year and a half. Harash has been hit. Um, he stopped the bleeding, but he still got a cut going right down his face that he just won't heal. Uh, when I was writing it, I, I really had to think about like the effects of having lived as long as they've lived and seeing what they've seen. And like their bodies just can't, their bodies can't take anymore. Their bodies are, are, are are just starting to fail. Um, <clears throat> Kai's not glowing anymore. Uh, he's not. Uh, he's not able to heal as well. Harass can't heal. Um, at the end of this, I'm going to jump to the end. At the end of this, Harass kills a man. And when he kills him, I'm going to go to the end so that I don't get this wrong. I don't want to miss this. Um, Harass kills this man. And um, Kai rushes to his side. And then Harask vanishes. <clears throat> this man dies. And when he dies, he, um, Kai feels something in his chest. He opens up his chest and there's a second heart that has been fused and sewn to his chest. That's there because of some event that that man's death caused. Um, some event caused Kai to need a second heart. Um, he also has a stabbing pain in his leg that he didn't have before. So now he's walking with a limp. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's horrific for them to live through. Um, time travel is not as fun as I say it is after it's been so long.
Okay. <clears throat> so they eat. And Harask knows what his meal is going to be. Um, Kai brings wine that Harask... <laughs> he, brings, he brings wine that... Um, that uh, is a uh, taunt to Harask. The wine is called the Knighting of Rafe Ivory Fist. The Knighting of Rafe Ivory Fist takes place in Hemlock um, <clears throat> a year before this story takes place. No, it takes place, it takes place in the book Crown. I'm sorry. It takes place in the book Crown a year before um, this takes place. And the Knighting of Ivory Fist, Harask is upset about him because he caused Rafe to stop trying to be a knight um, 10,000 years ago by giving him, by moving pieces into place that would make Harask, uh, well, that would make Rafe Ivory Fist leave the knighthood altogether. So he was never supposed to um, to become a knight. Trimerian wine is always named after a great event that happens that year. This was the knighting of Rafe Ivory Fist. The land is so suffused with the power that it knows great things that are happening around it. And if you're a, a connoisseur of wine, particular Chimerian wine, then you can drink the wine and know the event that happened that year. And Harask, when he drinks, he says, I thought I stopped Ivory Fist from becoming a knight. Thought I forced a self-exile. That dagger was supposed to lock him up for 50,000 years. Um, uh, that dagger runs all the way through um, the Manhunters. It is the reason that Rafe um, left the knighthood. And during the course of the trilogy, that problem uh, runs its course. And I'm not going to tell you about the problem. Um, all I can tell you is that, uh, it's, it's pretty intense. Now, a while ago, um, I, a while ago, I read you, um, in the first season, I read you a story called The Banshee, and in The Banshee, Kai ends up losing his voice. It says here, Kai had not heard his own voice in 130,587 years. Kai was glowing when he started going back in time. Kai is the son of one of the original Trimerians which means Kai was close to 120,000 years when he started this. This makes Kai almost 250,000 years old. A mind like that can hardly be grasped. He's also doing such uh, he's also doing <clears throat> such amazing things and so intricate and plotting to make this happen by making this happen by making this happen and setting up chains of events that lead to other things and and his mind is that old um basically what i'm saying is i can't do this much longer without completely losing his mind kai has a scroll <clears throat> The scroll scribbles down his thoughts. And when he's, he, one of the things he says is, one of the things um, Harask says is, uh, 
I hid the short sword and the bastard sword. There's no way you found them. Now, <clears throat> in the book Hemlock, uh, one of the heads of the Trimerian Knights named Glimmer gives Rafe a short sword and a bastard sword. Uh, these swords hold the souls of some trapped soul and some trapped uh, people, um, <clears throat> like the one in the dagger that Rafe has vowed to uh, to save. He's got to get all the swords together of all the Thorn Brothers. <clears throat> the short sword and the bastard sword harass hid in impossible places to find, and Kai was able to find them and get them to the guy who could get them the Rafe. Um, so in Hemlock, uh, Glimmer just pulls them out and gives them the Rafe. We never know, we never knew how he got them, and this is how he got them. Uh, <clears throat> He, uh, Harask says, you still have no answer for Mending Keep. Um, Mending Keep is something that also happens in the Manhunters. Um, it's <clears throat> a prison that's broken into that kicks off the entire series when a group of people are gathered together from that prison and made to work as one. Um, uh, Harask says, you still have no answer for Mending Keep. The Stain, which is the name of that group, will still roam untouched. The city of Hemlock is overrun by vampires. <clears throat> and Terratrape is awoken, this world will bleed. So when Terratrape is awoken, this world will bleed. Okay, this is the first time we've heard the name Terratrape. And... One of the things that happens in this is that Kai hires an assassin named Julius Chris to kill a man named Reichard the Braun. Reichard the Braun's death is um, <clears throat> Reichard the Braun is in the book Legends Paralysk. Um, <clears throat> when he dies, he pisses off a certain group of people. And that group of people <clears throat> have a badass with them named Dreyarch. And Dreyarch decides to join Rafe and join Rafe's group of people to, that he gathers together to hunt down all these escape prisoners. Um, Dreyarch decides to join because one of the people that Rafe is going after is Julius Cress. So Kai has an answer for Minden Keep. And that answer is part of that answer is killing Raghar the Brawn so that Dreyarch will join Rafe's group when Rafe's group is put together. <clears throat> the city of Hemlock is overrun with vampires. Uh, very true. Um, that's the whole plot of Hemlock is that vampires are taking it over. But <clears throat> in the book, there's a section a very easy to forget section they're talking about the master the master the master the master quite a bit <clears throat> and in one section of the book at the very end this madman gets off his ship and he's rowing away and he's got a coffin with him that coffin is carrying teratrape um teratrape is a character from uh <clears throat> the book Purgatory. She was somebody from the second age. She was a character, a person that was created, a human that was created during the second age. You gotta find information about the second age in Legends of Paralysk. Um, <clears throat> Terra Trape was a woman. Uh, she was pretty evil when she was born. She got into necromancy. Necromancy turned into uh, her becoming the first vampire. Um, <clears throat> Terra Trape is not dead, but almost dead in that box. 
they're all talking about the master through the whole thing and they mean they're a trip. Uh, <clears throat> if Teratrape is awoken the whole world, he says this world will bleed and it's true. She's way too powerful. She's way too evil. Um, <clears throat> she pretty much can't be killed. Uh, and so um, he start and uh, Harask got somebody to break into the prison of Minden Keep and and then vampires took over Hemlock and then now he's hoping that Terra Strape wakes up. Uh, Kai's got that problem he's got to fix. So Men and Keep is in song. The stain is, it runs all through the Manhunters. Terra Trape is just mentioned, but you can find more about the sec Second Age in um, Legend of Paralesque. And uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the food that the Gilded Mar Mares is just, it's just terrible. It's terrible. And there's a part where Kai just can't eat anymore. And he pushes it away. And Haras just chuckles. And he's, yeah, that's, that's right. You shove it away. Let yourself get weak. You won't need your strength. And he's right. Haras is right. Joy of food is not something that Kai has the um, taking joy in food and only eating good food is not a luxury that Kai has anymore. Um, okay, back to Legends of Paralesque. There's something he says in here that Harass says in here, uh, Septimut was a nice touch. Ember had no answer for him. You even tricked me into sending Simon straight to her. Uh, that's all talked about in Legends of Paralesque. It's a very cool story. I'm very proud of this story. Legends of Paralesque is a, is a collection of short stories and this is one of those short stories. It's called The Queen's Tale. Um, Ember uh, is a dragon. And in the book, in the story of the slave that we talked about, um, uh, in the first in the first season, uh, one of the things that Harass does that they that they have to watch in horror is that he frees Ember, um, and <clears throat> basically that entire story, if you read the entire story by itself before tonight, you would have read a cool story about a dragon but if you read it now you can see that Harask was the one that freed her Harask sent Simon to her and Kai is the reason something showed up um it's uh it just it just keeps winding over itself knot after knot rope after rope twist after twist um Okay, so Kel and Justine do not bother me as much as you think they do. There are other paths to a bass day for Peter than their child. Kel and Justine. Okay, Kel is in the book uh, Legends of Eastgate, another small. <laughs> Short story collection. <clears throat> I think it has uh, two novellas and two short stories. And Kel is one of them. Um, Kel is a blood blade, which is a character from the mountain. Justine is a Fendi, which is a character from the mountain. And they were supposed to have a child, but Harask broke them up. Um, Kai's saying 
That doesn't bother me as much as you think it does. There are other paths to a best day for Peter. So <clears throat> in the Madness Wars, there's a character named Peter Redfist. Uh, he has a best day name, named um, Jordi Stonefist. Kel and Justine's child was supposed to be Peter's best day. Um, <clears throat> so Jordi Stonefist, as awesome as he is in the Madness Wars, he's second choice. So you gotta ask yourself, what would the first choice for Peter's best day have been if Jordi Stonefist was so awesome? What was he supposed to have? And what could Peter have done if Kel and Justine had had that child and Peter had that child as a best day? If you read um, Legends of Eastgate, you're gonna find out that Kel is one of the most innovative people. He's creative and he's, he's cunning. And <clears throat> he stops a war by offering to draw maps. He's destroys an entire uh, camp of soldiers. He Kel does all that by himself, just from being stealthy and intelligent. Um, Justine is, I, I, I don't think that you have met up with Justine yet, but Justine is, um, she's called Justine the Paw, and she's a shaman, a water shaman. Um, what would that child have looked like with Justine's power and Kel's mind? Um, we just will never know. Um, so basically Kai has to scramble to find a way to get Justine to fall in love with somebody that is a half breed. So apart from one um, nation of the mountain and apart from another nation of the mountain, um, He's got to scramble to kind of to put those two people together. Uh, <clears throat> and he does so when he creates Jordi. Now you can see the baby that is the result of Jordi Stonefist Sr. and Justine. That baby <clears throat> is in the Legends of Exiles. That becomes Peter's best day, and that baby was supposed to be Kel and Justine's baby. It was supposed to be a better. Peter was supposed to have even a better best day than he did. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Wanted to give you this, and he gives him a blackened skull, and he calls it Trolava Bentek. Now, I found out who this was um, when I wrote another um, Sour Eye short story. I have not made it public yet, but this Black and Skull thing is more than a problem. Trolava Bintek is more than important. And if Haras got to him, then he has a treasure that Kai simply can't, I mean, he wouldn't know how to. Kai doesn't have an answer for this. And Kai is supposed to know who Trollava Bintek is, but he can't remember it because he's so old and he's got other things on his mind. He should remember that name. And when he does remember that name, he's gonna panic and he should because her ask having that skull is just such, such bad news for everybody. It's just such bad news for everybody. And, he, and her ask says, you don't know him. 
and he he says it as a statement. There's a period at the end of that sentence, not a question mark. He says it as a statement. So he knows that Kai has forgotten all about this person. And then he laughs and causes a headache. <clears throat> Uh, then they start talking about what they're going to do afterwards. They start talking about what they're going to do afterwards. Harass wants to sit on a cliff with them. The nemesis have gotten to the point where they're friends. <clears throat> they meet here every so often. They meet at the Gilded Mares. They're friends because they're the only people that they have in common. Then the nightmares. I haven't written anything about the nightmares. Um, I can't tell you much. All I can tell you <coughs> is that Harask dreams of a woman. And Kai dreams of a dog. And he says in, on his scroll, he said, every time I see it, I lose a bit of my mind. Rusk said, she started off beautiful. Kai says, mine did too. Rusk says, but every time she gets, Kai answered with angrier. It's, yeah it's getting bad now <clears throat> Harask says something interesting here he says I, I stopped hating you 70,000 years ago now I wish you would just stop <clears throat> this has been going on so long that it's being it's a torture to them now they can't remember what they've done and what they haven't done They've got so many problems, so many holes to fix that the other one's poked in. Um, and they just, they just want it all to end. And <clears throat> then it starts talking about addiction. What we find out in the end of the story is that both of them are addicted addicted to the sensation that they get when they go back or forward in time. It gives them a certain um, high that they're addicted to. So as much as they want to stop, they're addicted to that feeling. And that addiction is something they, when they they can't. It says neither could quit. Harass thinks about it for a while. He thinks about ending the war. Um, <clears throat> after doing this for so long, they're both questioning whether they should keep doing this. Harask thinks about it for a while and then he laughs and he says, no, it all burns. But he doesn't say it with a passion. And he doesn't explain why. And he doesn't get aggressive about it. And say, no, it all burns because da 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 He just said, no, period. It all burns. <clears throat> And that is basically a damning resolution. <clears throat> He's doing it now almost out of habit. He's doing it now almost out of habit. He's doing it now because he said he would. And he's trying to keep his word. 
And then he says, this one thing that I think is really intense. It's almost like a, okay, so um, I have this uncle. In the book, I call him Uncle Ball. It was completely unhealthy for me and I didn't know it at the time. And I was very close with him during all of my life until Guardian's War hit, which you can read about when Normal Street comes out. He used to say that when all the wives were gone, when me and his wives were gone, and all the kids had left, that me and him would get a house somewhere. And we'd spend the rest of our days in a house, sitting on a porch, drinking. I don't think he said beer. I don't think the man drinks beer. He didn't say something as, as quaint as lemonade, maybe tea, I don't know. And my uncle said, we'll sit on the porch and we'll, everybody will be gone and we'll just try to figure it all out. That's what he said. Um, and it asked what I thought would end up happening. And so I met Becca um, and her ass said something very similar to this. He says, and one day we will sit on a cliff somewhere looking out at the ash and wait for our death. He's, <clears throat> he knows there's no afterlife for them. And he knows there's no hope for them. And the war will just continue forever. Um, and then one day after her ask is won, he says, he speaks of, of this and he talks about it and it's just a, um, almost like a fantasy that he has with that one day they'll just sit and watch the end of the world. I don't know what's gonna end up happening in my, in the last couple of books that I write. Maybe this will come to pass or maybe there'll be some other thing that happens with Harask and Kai, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> The Gilded Mares used to be in a very nice part of town. Kai and Haras continually coming back has soured not only the building, but also the neighborhood. Because when they get out of the Gilded Mares, they see children rifling through the dead pockets of the Trimerian dead in the gutter. It's just gotten so bad. And they keep coming back to this bar. The fact that they keep coming back to this bar is significant because Sky can see how bad it's getting. Kai can see how bad it's getting. Kai can see that there's, the neighborhood has gone to shit. The bar has gone to shit. The food has gone to shit. The waitress has gone to shit. The whole thing is being corrupted by the power that they wield. And Kai could say, next time we'll meet here. Next time we'll meet here. He could pick a different time, a different place each time. Um, so that that corruption never gathers up in one place for so long. The fact that he has continued to come back here with Harask over and over and over and over again, even though he knows that the corruption of the power that they use is destroying the place, shows that there's a certain level of callous that's growing in Kai. Now I know what I want 
to happen with Kai and Harask. I figured out what I want to happen. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull it off. Um, I figured out what I want to happen. I haven't figured out the end, but I figured out um, an event and how it's going to change. Um, the first book of the Silent uh, War of the Sour Eye is a collection of um, stories that are all told from Kai's point of view. There's going to be a second book that's all told from Haraf's point of view. I have a concept for that book already put together and I know what it's going to look like and grimdark it's grimdark uh Kai pulls a crystal sword and it's grown it's glowing green the same color the sour eye is the sword is corrupted and now it's the power that he uses to do what he needs to do Harask pulls a demon steel fist dagger. Uh, Hellforged is what it should say. Um, <clears throat> the fact that it's called demon steel uh, says that somewhere in the world, the term changed for a dagger made in hell. It used to be called Hellforged. And Jordi has a Hellforged blade in the Madness Wars. In Onslaught of Madness, he uses it on a guy. But he has it through the whole book. Um, in a book that hasn't come out yet, that takes place before the Madness Wars, uh, Jordi actually cuts Aaron the Mark with this um, with this Hellforged dagger that it never heals. There's a scar that runs across Aaron the Mark's cheek that's black. And <clears throat> in Wrath of Madness, he's in a... Yay, masculine, but horrific boxing match. And that cheek just busts open again. It never really heals. Now that dagger that Jordi call and carries is called a Hell Forged dagger. This is called a steam, a demon steel dagger. Yet the body did exactly what a Hell Forged dagger did. So the term changes, and that's significant. I just wrote it. I don't know why the term changes, um, but the term changes. And that is significant in some way that I don't, I don't understand. Now, Kai Harask is walking one way, Kai's walking the other way, and Harask yells out, Kai, and he grabs a guy, and he stabbed him with the dagger. And he kills a dagger and he says, didn't see that one coming, did you? So Kai missed something before he went into Gilded Mares. He should have checked. There's just too much to check. There's too much to see. There's too much to learn about. There's too much research to be done. Kai just can't know it all and Harass can't know it all. And Kai goes in and he drives the blade of his crystal sword into the man's dead body to see who he would have been and what he would have done. And what he sees makes him cry. Um, and Kai stumbled back and dropped to his knees. He looked at his sword knowing it would never end. He felt the throb in his cloak and then another one. This is where he realizes that because this man died, he ended up with a um, 
a second heart. Um, I'm, I've been thinking about that. And I'm thinking at some point, these bodies have to start deteriorating to the point where they don't work anymore. And basically, at some point, something happened with Kai where his heart stopped working and he had to have another one put on his body. So what else will have to do that? Um, will he have to get new lungs? Will he have to get new kidneys? Will they all be outside his body? Um, it asks too many questions. It, the, the thing is just, there's just, there's just too much. It's just too much. So he says he had to set it all aside. He needed to find Julius Chris, the vile assassin would be moving through this town 21 years ago. So 21 years ago, he's gonna be there, meet up with Julius Chris, and he's gotta hire Julius Chris to kill Ray Cardinal um, which we've already talked about. Uh, Greg Hart the Braun is actually um, one of my favorite characters. Uh, he's a very small part of a short story called um, The Stalwart that's in um, Legends of Paralesque. Very small part in there, but he has a large part in a new series that I'm releasing. Um, the new series uh, is called The Garden of Infamy. And it is backstory about a about one character in particular that tells the arc of a major part of their life. The first Garden of Infamy book, they're all novellas, um, but the first Garden of Infamy book it's called Seeds of Revenge. They'll all be seeds of something. Seeds of Revenge is about a character named Revenge. Revenge is a major character in Plight of Madness and uh, Fate of Madness. And Seeds of Revenge answers a very significant question that is brought up in the Madness Wars. And it also answers so many other things. And it goes forward into the timeline um, to show you things that don't really, they're all important. Everything about that book is important, but some of it you need to know you needed to know back then. And some of it you'll need to know in the future. And, um, but it's all important. So the last part of the book on uh, Seeds of Revenge is, um, it's just, uh, it can be confusing because you don't know what's moving around you. But her storyline does this, and it's coming to a climax in the last pages. If you just look at the arc of her character, and you are able to look through the haze of all the story around her that you don't know. Um, so anyway. Not sure how I got started on that. Um, oh, okay. So book one of Garden of Infamy is called Seeds of Revenge. Book two of, uh, of Garden of Infamy um, has Ray Hard the Braun in it. I'm not gonna give you the title of that book. I don't even know when I'm gonna release it. Um, <clears throat> it's about a 100 page novella. I can't. <laughs> I can't tell you that. Um, it's a 100 page novella. It's about one particular character. And 
um, how he became what he is. And it ties into um, Legends of Eastgate. This Gardens of Infamy, I don't remember, I don't know when I'm gonna release it. I release books from it. Um, basically, when I feel like they're ready, um, when I feel like my readers need them, um, when I feel like uh, I need to release something, I'll drop a, a Gardens of a Garden of Infamy. As it sits, I have, let's see. As it sits, I have five Garden of Infamy books prepared to be released. The first one's gonna be released. I am almost positive it's February 15th. Um, it's already up for pre-order. I'm pretty positive it's, it's February 15th. Um, and the other book, I don't know, I could release in the summer of 2022. Um, I could release in March of 2022. I, or we could not see one again until February. I don't know when they're coming out. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay attention to my fans. I'm going to pay attention to my fans. And any fan that's part of my life um, that I know of, if they're going through a hard time and they talk to me about it um, and they need some kind of distraction, I'm going to put out a Garden of Infamy book. Um, last year, uh, when the pandemic was really bad before the vaccine came out, there wasn't a lot of hope in America or in the world in general. There wasn't a lot of hope. And I don't, I don't have, I don't have much. Uh, I don't, I, I can't heal the world. But I can provide a little bit of a distraction, a little bit of entertainment. So what I did um, <clears throat> when it came to uh, the summer, everybody was still dealing heavily with the pandemic and we were just starting to see it grow and see the horror that it would become. I released Legends of Eastgate, not on my regular release day. Just, I just threw it out because I knew that my fans needed something. They needed something to read. They needed something to take their mind off of it, if even for the length of a novella. Um, so I threw out Legends of Eastgate. And the same is going to be true with Gardens of Infamy. Um, it's a book that's meant to heal people. It's a series that's meant to heal people um, in the only way that I have, which is storytelling. I write dark fantasy, uh, sometimes grimdark. This story, for sure, is grimdark. And I'm part of a group called Fantasy Faction on Facebook. If you love fantasy um, and you want to talk to other people that love fantasy, then you need recommendations for other fantasy to read. Go check out Fantasy Faction. Um, I think it's also Fantasy Faction and Sci-Fi now, but I don't remember the name of the group. Um, I'll try to find a way to link to it. But basically, um, there was a, a question asked. I think it was there. It might have also been in a group called Grimdark Readers and Writers. 
grimdark fiction readers and writers, which is another really good group um, if you're into really dark fantasy. Anyway, somebody asked, why do we read grimdark? Why do we read dark fantasy and how does that help us? <clears throat> why don't we read um, they're, they, they're coming up with a name for it. They haven't landed on one yet. Um, it was called Noble Bright for a while. I've heard it called, I think, Hope Punk. Um, but it's the exact opposite of Grimdark. It's got shiny characters doing shiny things, helping dull people shine their soul um one of my series is actually noble brain <clears throat> one of the garden of infamy books will be um from that series anyway um we, are, we were asked, people were asked, um, why Grimdark? Why Dark Fantasy? Why read something so glum and, and, and gloomy? And uh, I can tell you that the reason that I write it is because of the past that I've lived and the dark things that have happened to me. It's a way for me to discuss the world's darkness without getting caught up in it. And the answer that they came to was very similar to that. But I want to tell a story um, before we get out of here. Uh, this is the last part of this video. I want to tell a story about my alpha reader team. I don't know if you guys know what an alpha reader is. Words like that are thrown around in the writing community so much. I don't think they take the time to explain it to people who are just readers um, that aren't in that, that world, who just want to read a book. Um, <clears throat> but um, in the process of writing, you need to know if you're messing up, so I have one person who's been, re been able to read everything I've written. Her name is T. She's fantastic, a very close friend. Um, she lives about five hours from here. Every time our family is going through something traumatic um, and difficult, uh, she makes a trip to see us, give us somebody to talk to. Um, anyway, she's a fantastic person and she read Chaste, which Chaste, if you read Chaste just as a grimdark book, you can see that it is one of the darker concoctions. It's almost a horror. Um, but there's a, there's an underlining meaning to chase that is um, there's an underlining meaning to chase that you have to look for that you can't find and it's it's not dark and horrible anyway she was reading chase a lot she got the original version of Chase, which its original version was 776 pages long. Um, still her favorite book. <laughs> uh, her, uh, the new one is like 300 and something. I chopped a lot out. It was the first book that I wrote and I tried to stuff all my world building into one book. Um, that never works out. Anyway. <clears throat> it's a very dark book. 
and she was just obsessed with it. And I asked her why one day. Um, and I asked her why, because I write things like Gilded Mares, which Gilded Mares contains zero hope and zero light. So I asked her why one day, why she liked it so much. And she said, I'm a nurse. And I see darkness all the time. And I don't get to express it. She dealt with, as a nurse, she dealt with death constantly. And pain constantly. And she had to remain professional about it. There was no way for her to express it. And so she found some kind of, she found some kind of sanity in uh, reading my work. Um, in the group that was, was talking about why we were being dream dark, what it came down to is the world is full of pain and is full of darkness and it's it's an ugly place sometimes and some sometimes when somebody's in pain they need to know that they're not alone they're not alone in their pain and they they're not alone in their pain and they need to uh, They need to see other people in pain and how they deal with it. And it eases theirs to know that they're not alone. So I guess that's what Gilded Mares does. <clears throat> Gilded Mares is written for the person that gets up every day, works way too hard for way too little has to put on a smile when they're dying inside. It's for the person that sees no hope. Uh, and Gilded Mares helps them know that they're not alone. That's why I wrote it. It's why I write Sour Eye stories. Um, because the battle between Harask and Kai is never ending. And a lot of times you hear the War of the Silent Eye or you'll hear me refer to it as Silent Eye, but I think, I mean, a sour eye, but I think the most important words of the title of the series is the silent war. Silence war are the two most important not sour eye silent war everybody is going through one it's been said so many times now that it's a cliche um but i think of that when i'm walking around when i'm talking to people when i'm interacting with people <clears throat> I think about the war that they're fighting. Uh, I don't get to know anything about. And sometimes I can be talking to somebody and know they need a hug. And I can't hug them. <sighs> because it'll make it worse or it'll make them crack or it'll make them break. Um, there's very little that I can do for the people that are fighting their silent war, that are fighting their, fighting through their life, hopelessness and all that. There's very little that I can do. Um, but I can't share myself. And I do that by writing my autobiography. 
I'm not going to plug it, but I have to plug it. Uh, Normal Street is coming out as soon as I possibly can get it out. Um, I'm working on it to make it perfect. Um, but my goal is to drop it as soon as possible. Um, Teardrop does the same thing. So I write any of my stories and I let people know by writing grim dark and by writing dark fantasy that they're not alone in their pain. It's why I released Legends of Eastgate when I did. It's why I'm putting out Seeds of Revenge when I am. It's why I'll drop Garden of Infamy books, novellas. <clears throat> Whenever I see the world around me losing hope, Um, because I have to be able to provide for the world around me. Because I can't hug everybody in pain, and I can't fix everybody, and I can't heal your poverty, and I can't, I just can't. So um, that's our show for today. Uh, you got to see my brown hat. I hope you think it's spiffy. You got to see my brown pocket square. Um, I got to trick you into thinking that I'm wearing a brown shirt um, because of the coloring on this video. <laughs> it's actually maroon, but it looks awful brown. Um, so I will see you next Friday. Um, do all the things. And thank you very much for giving me your time. Um, Benny's baseline is going to see you to the door. Good night. Here we are. I have my correction shirt on. The boss is upset. I uh, forgot to talk about something. So I got that face. Do the face. I got that face. So I wanted to say, um, I talked about uh, a character named Sethany um, when I talked about the story of the Queen's Tale in Legend of Paralyzed. Sethany Moot is actually in a book called uh, Crisis of Fate. Um, he's a pretty major part of the book Crisis of Fate. Um, so that's the thing. I also, uh, he also makes a cameo in the book that's coming out um, very soon, October 5th. Uh, he, he makes a cameo in that book. Um, so, if you want to know more about Sethi Moon, that's um, another place that you can go. So, uh, are you satisfied? So very satisfied really extremely satisfied. I couldn't be more satisfied than I am right now. Did you buy that? You did a good job. Good job. <laughs> okay. So that was my correction. Um yeah. So back to the song. about being satisfied um <clears throat> when i mentioned he's going to be on cameo in the book that was coming that's coming out on october 5th i forgot to mention that um that book was called scorch it starts a new series um called the burdens of beasts and uh so look for that october 5th um and you'll see something that's uh cameo <laughs>